Okay, so that's a track of the Dark Star album called North, um, which came out last year. Um, the significance of, uh, of that record that is partly to do with its context, <coughs> uh, it came out on a hyperdub label, which is largely but not exclusively associated with dubstep. Um, and it really comes out of this um, trajectory starting that I was talking about yesterday, st starting off with um, rave going through jungle, drum and bass, garage. Um, and I think this, this track then, and this, the whole sound of it, and the whole album, North, is quite symptomatic um, for a number of reasons. One of which is just the, the, the level of sort of uh, introversion and melancholy um, that, that uh, is palpable in that track and the whole sound of it. By comparison with the collective euphoria um, of that was the start of that trajectory. Um, so from being music that was about certain experience of collectivity, um, it becomes a music about um, isolation, um, a particular quality of melancholy, which I started to point to yesterday, the, some of the causes of that, um, that melancholy, a kind of um, digital, digital melancholy. Um, and that's what I wanted, really want to explore today, um, partly, is the, the form of that digital melancholy. Um, particularly in relation to this, what I see as this crisis of space-time brought about by um, communicative capitalism, you could say. Um, so the first thing, to, so the first thing to know about that music then is the um, the sadness, the introversion, um, the fact that it's really a, a about a, a an individual in a way that the music that inspired it was, was really not. Um, the second thing to note about it is the strange atemporality of the sound. Now, though that came out in 2010, um, there's nothing very much marking it out as coming from 2010. Um, there's, you know, there's certain glitches or effects on the vocal, digital effects, um, that you wouldn't expect to have found on a record um, coming out in 1990. Um, but that if you'd have, have, you'd ha had have heard something like that, wouldn't have caused you a great shock. Um, I think part of the, the temporal dimension of the crisis I'm talking about is this issue of, um, well, atemporality, the question of uh, just perform this test in your mind. If you could imagine something being played on the radio in a particular year um, from the past that has come out now, would it have caused a shock or not? And I think increasingly we can imagine going further and further back in time with music that is now presented to us as contemporary and imagining it not causing a shock. So I think if, the, if, if that, can we imagine that record played in uh, as far back as 1980 even? and uh, people being shocked, I, or, or even surprised or perturbed. I don't think so even. I think we can imagine that record coming on the radio in 1980 and people thinking it was, you know, uh, some group inspired by New Order or something like that. Do you know, you know um, that's quite odd. And that, that I, think, well, we, I, don't, I think we take this for granted now. Think how long ago 1980 is, you know, um, 1980 years, like, I have to remind myself, you know, 30 years ago, over <laughs> 30 years ago, whatever. And um, just think about the difference between 1950 and 1980. You know, if you took, if you took let's say, a New Order record from, uh, from 1980 and t took it back to 1950 uh, and put that on the radio, there would be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, disjuncture there. You know, people uh, would... Uh, be surprised at what they were hearing, you know. Um, the, the, the whole span, think of the whole span. 
1950 pre-rock and roll to 1980 post-punk, disco. Uh, Post-disco by that point. You know, not everything that was in between that. Um, you know, vast changes in, in, in music and culture. The 30 years subsequent, we're in a situation where, um, you know, uh, a group who, uh, you know, are, are coming out of the, and can I issue a record on, um, you know, one of the leading um, sort of popular experimental labels in the UK. Uh, and it could, and it, we can conceive of that record having come out 30 years ago. I'm not saying it actually could have done, but the point is, that it's possible to, to perform that thought experiment, isn't it? Where someone did hear it and thought, okay. Um, now, this is not criticism of Dark Star or criticism of anything, really. It's just, just to point to the, the, the strange and in, involuted and, and sort of enfolded um, temporality in, uh, in which we now live. The, the increasingly flattened out um, nature of sort of cultural time. Second slide, oh yes. Right, okay, we've moved. We've moved forward. Right. Okay, um, okay, so uh, anyone recognize this? F what, uh, what, do, you know, do you know what film this is from? Is it Dawn of the Dead? Oh, God, <laughs> interesting, no. It's uh, that... Um, that's <laughs> no, that's really good though. Uh, it's from the terminal. Uh, have, uh, have you seen this film? With uh, it's on British TV like every week. It seems to be on every week, and um, you know, I, I, I sort of I see it halfway through, and I've, I've done, and I don't think I've ever seen the whole thing. Uh, but I keep watching, I keep watching. It. I don't know why. And then oh, I didn't know why, and then I realised the message it was trying to send me. Okay, this is this film is um, really quite a little known Spielberg film. Uh, with Tom Hanks in possibly his most annoying film ever, an annoying role ever. Um, and that's saying something, given it's Tom Hanks, right? But uh, well, he plays this... Um, he plays uh, someone who comes from, I, I think it's a, a fictional East European country. But while he's flying over to the US, there's a, some civil war <coughs> in his country, uh, and that country ceases to exist, so he becomes a stateless citizen. So that um, when he arrives in the um, uh, JFK, um, uh, he's not allowed to leave the airport. And uh, so he has to stay in the airport uh, for weeks and I don't know if it's months, a long time anyway. And it's apparently it's based on a real case actually. Um, and okay, so what, what message is this trying to send me? Okay, well, this, uh, what is the fantasy here? Well, remember that, um, uh, you know, Baudrillard said the point of Disneyland was to establish that it was a real America that was beyond, you know, that was beyond Disneyland, that could be differentiated from Disneyland. Well, isn't the point of the terminal to establish that there is a real America beyond the airport that will be different from being in the airport itself? You know, that, uh, that when you leave, that when he, uh, you know, when the Tom Hanks character gets to leave the airport, there'll be something vastly different from this array of shops and chain stores and all of that that, you, that he can go into. Um, you know, that, that, <laughs> but that is not true. But actually, what, what is interesting, having just been to JFK recently for the first time, is the way that this, uh, this, this, uh, this airport bears no relation to JFK. And that's not a very good image of it, actually. But uh, if, you, if you see the film, the film is full of um, um, sort of franchise, retail, multinationals, all of that. Um, JFK is actually qu pretty modest, uh, the amount of, the, the, the amount of um, shops that are there. Um, is it America called Russian airport? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really, particularly if you've come from like Heathrow, where, uh, Terminal 5, which, it, you know, where you're like immersed in, um, you know, a global shopping mall. And to go to the US, and it, it is somewhat Sovietized, it feels like that. that they, they just learn about, oh, we can have shops at airports. But, the, the <laughs> but th so they constructed this uh, simulated, hyper commodified, hyper commercialized JFK for this film. Um, and here's perhaps one. Another dimension of capitalist realism. Uh, you know, capitalist realism, when I coined the term, I didn't actually coin it. I mean, I'd, the way I used it is, is kind of specific, I suppose, to, to, to a series of interests of mine. But actually, other people have used it before, notably um, German, a group of German pop artists in the 60s um, who really uh, who used, used it as a, an echo, which I also intended, of socialist realism. 
you know, so socialist realism, you know, as uh, what brought in under Stalin to replace the early efflorescence of modernism after the, after the 1917 revolution, you know, to bring back sort of familiar images, familiar propagandist, familiar and familial propagandistic images, you know, the family together, all muscle bound and all of that, and with, um, uh, you know, plows and machinery. Um, and, you know, so part of the, uh, my notion of capitalist realism was, you know, what is the, what is the we, we, we clearly live in the midst of that, but it's PR and advertising, which, which are, you know, our, our equivalent of, of, of that. Um, and, of course, uh, if one is to realistically represent what it's like to live in um, capitalism, then you have to have lots of um, brands everywhere, lots of product placement. And the level of product placement in, um, in the terminal is massive. Ev you know, every scene has got um, him in, in some retail outlet or holding some, um, you know, debris from some franchise, um, uh, franchise multinational in his hands. You uh, have to take the job in the airport to be able to buy a Hugo Boss. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, okay, now... So why am I talking about this now? Well, um, what I'm int uh, in increasingly interested in is the parallels, really, between um, what I was first talking about, which is this uh, sense of, uh, to use the term um, that um, Bruce Sterling, the, sci <coughs> the cyberpunk, the former cyberpunk author, um, has started to circulate, atemporality. What is the relationship between that sp sense of atemporality and sp space? Um, airports were a classic example of what uh, the French theorist Marc Auger has called a non-place. Um, in his book, Non-Places, um, he makes an opposition between um, this kind